like I said, I am not a professional politician. So right now I'd like to tell you what I am. And I am a political leader. And I'd like to tell you guys the difference between them. It's long been known that the lust for power can drive even the most moral person into bed with corruption. At a time when government restraint is needed the most, the Congress, President, and the court have looked past the law of the land and have slipped into bed with corruption, causing ramifications that will be felt for many years to come. Due to the misplaced trust that most people have within their government, they assume what their leaders are doing is right, regardless of what the Constitution says. I, like many others, am shocked and appalled by what is happening in Washington, D.C., and how little respect the government has for our Constitution. It is the very nature of power to result in corruption, and unfortunately, we are all corruptible people, but it takes principles to fight against it. The corruption in Washington, DC, in Washington is penetrating and empowering to power-hungry professional politicians. This type of corruption is so silently inflicted upon the people that they don't even know what's going on, and many of them view the issue as completely irrelevant to their daily lives and can continue to put their trust in these masters of lies and bad legislation. When a company hires a new employee, most of the time they're looking for somebody with experience because this makes the candidate uh, a professional in that field. We as a nation have carried over this sign of possible positive outcomes in the workplace to the political realm and have been hiring professional politicians as elected officials for some time now. We look at this, the, this experience in politics as if it is a good thing and that if a president, senator, or congressperson is re-elected, that somehow is a wonderful thing. The fact of the matter is, the longer someone sits in any area of elected office, excuse me, sorry, um, the more likely it is they will be beholden to special interest groups. Some elected officials even take up contracts with these groups and lobby for them once they leave office. What's more is that some make more money as lobbyists than they ever did as being elected officials. There is a game being played in Washington, D.C., and we're not the players, we're the pieces. The experience gained from modern politics isn't at all what most of us would consider an asset to one's professional resume. For example, would a person be willing to hire a candidate whose resume under skills listed very believable liar, or abysmal budgeting skills, or how about under management style, read controlling and egotistical. Absolutely not. But when we change the words and add campaign slogans, sound bites, and empty promises in a highly delusional mainstream media, and then pow, you're looking at the next president of the United States. What we have in Washington, D.C. is a cesspool of liars, thieves, murderers, and tyrants, all working diligently to make sure that the game continues and that the only losers in the entire picture are the people. We've been told repeatedly that these people we elect are our leaders and that the president is the daddy of them all. This, this can't be uh, further from the truth. These people can't be our leaders simply because they fail to fit the description. There isn't any leadership in Washington, D.C. There is only control. The only tools they have at their immediate disposal are fear, theft, and lies that are then propagated to the masses using the same highly delusional mainstream media that helped some of them get elected in the first place. We have been sending professional politicians to do the work of political leaders, and we are paying dearly for this deadly mistake. Political leaders are the ones willing to stand up for what is right in the face of adversity, the ones that are not afraid to talk about the real issues with their friends and neighbors, the ones that are willing to do the work necessary to connect with people, he, uh, the people he has chosen to serve. When someone is elected, to f uh, they find out real fast who runs the show, and to some, it's easier to go along and get along. But still, there are others who will dedicate their entire career ensuring that their future, that future generations would be able to pick up the pieces. Thomas Jefferson was one of these people. He enshrined independence as the, as the cornerstone of this nation, and with his words alone, declared it to a king at that time who had in his command 
the greatest military force the world had ever seen. He, along with others, took a stand for liberty and won the independence we proudly pretend to have today. What the fathers and the brave members of the Continental Army fought for has vanished due to our inability to be the guardians of this once great republic. We are no longer an independent nation. We are a dependent nation. We depend on foreign oil to quench our thirst for insatiable, uh, insatiable thirst for cheap energy. We depend on a banking cartel in order to keep the gears of the machine going by allowing it to print or even digitize our money to then loan it out to us um, and to the government, international corporations, or foreign central banks at interest. We depend upon the United Nations to tell us when and where we can go to war, among other infringements. We depend on the media to tell us the truth, when in reality we must seek the truth for ourselves. We are dependent on the federal government to fix every problem that arises regardless of the powers delegated to us by it, uh, by us to it in the Constitution. Professional politicians continue to lie in order to make you believe that they will be able to fix the economy by continuing to spend recklessly or by making cuts to proposed increases while maintaining our empire and allowing it to grow throughout the world. This is like putting a band-aid on an artery that's been cut with a serrated knife. Now more than ever, now more than ever, we need normal everyday Americans from across the country to stand, uh, to stand up and make, and make a stand for the Constitution and to fight the corruption being unleashed in Washington, D.C. in order to restore independence so that the sacrifices made for it shall not have been in vain. As political leaders, we will be able to end the madness caused by the special interest groups and corrupt professional politicians. We shall escort them from our houses and slam the door in their face while telling them, don't come back, ever. We have now come to a point where political parties are obsolete and that no matter the party, we realize that we must work together to solve our real issues we face. We all know that freedom isn't free, but it shouldn't cost us our liberties in order to pay the bill. If we continue to allow professional politicians to control this country by propagating fear and division among us, we will certainly perish and pass into history as one of the most deceived and derelict societies the world has ever known. The special interest groups that control our political process must be banished from Washington, D.C., and we citizens must pour in like a raging flood and take back what we have failed to keep under our control. Our biggest mistake is believing that the, federal, that the government of the United States is the highest authority, when in actuality, we are the highest authority in this land, and that everything that is going wrong with our national government rests soulfully on our, on our shoulders. We must resume our authority over them by being responsible for their actions and being vigilant of their mistakes so that they may be corrected and as to not allow them to be repeated or tolerated. Our people may be apathetic, but there is a political firestorm sweeping across this land that is burning deep within us all. The political uprising happening all across this nation is a direct result of the government's heavy-handedness and blatant disregard for the Constitution. And in fact, this may have created the person uh, you have become today and why you're here with everybody else. The truth is that there is no power to be had in Washington, D.C. The power they seek is inside each and every one of us. It is our duty as countrymen and women to wield this power in a manner that will most effectively protect our lives, liberty, and property from those who seek only to destroy it swiftly or incrementally. We deserve better and can do better. Once we've educated our friends and our neighbors that the ones being re-elected are not part of the solution, but are merely part of the problem. If we are to be successful at restoring our republic, we must be willing to start locally here at home and build each other up in order to knock down the giant we've all helped to feed. We must give new people a chance in helping f uh, right the wrongs of many years of bad decisions and fake leadership. We all know that the, the professional politicians that are currently in power will not go quietly into the night, as they should, as they should and, and will stop at nothing to attain and retain power by any means possible. 
What they fail to realize is, the light, is like sand. The harder they squeeze, the more we will continue to slip through their fingers. And these times of pure deceit, we are, living in the, uh, we are living in today. It is you and I that must bridge the gap between the world we want and the world we see. Because together, we are the political leaders we have all been waiting for. For the Republic. Like I said, I am not a professional politician. I'm doing this for my family. I have, you know, the only thing in my disposal right now is my ability to speak. To let other people's, people know that things are not okay. We are dying here. I am running against Kay Granger. She has been in office for 16 years. And I think that if you've been there for this long, you are part of the problem. You're not part of the solution. We have the ability to show the people that there are people out here that want change, that are willing to step up and fight for it. I have the most res utmost respect for our Constitution. And to see what's going on today is a slap in my face, as it is to all of y'all's. But to know that they're doing it and getting away with it on a daily basis is not acceptable, acceptable to me. If I am elected to the Congress, my very first act as an elected official is to introduce articles of impeachment against the President, the Vice President, and the Attorney General. <laughs> no person has done that. Now, we've gotten articles of impeachment against the Attorney General. Be, uh, good means. N not, it's not, nothing's going with it so far. I, w I wish we would get more attention on that. I really do. Um, but I call my congressperson, Kay Granger, almost yeah. every day demanding that she introduce articles of impeachment against the President for high crimes and misdemeanors, among them murder. And yet, I don't get a response. That's disrespectful. Mm -hmm. yep. I have to take my time out of my day to call them, yeah. to let them know how I feel, and they don't even respond. Yeah. And she works for you. Exactly. Right. Right. So, if I am to be true to my oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, I cannot raise my right hand and say that. That's not going to be my first act in office, you know, because if you're going to protect the Constitution, then your first act has to be to do something about the usurper. Yes. I have an issue with our federal government <coughs> coming into our states telling them what they can and cannot do. Yeah. We told them that a long time ago, before any of us were even born, what they can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. And they, can't, they don't respect it. Mm -hmm. Our federal government, like has been said, has a problem with the shalls and the shall nots of the Constitution. And that needs to change. Yes. In the Constitution, it does, it, in Article 4, or is it Article 2, Section 4, something, um, <laughs> when it talks about the removal of federal officials, it doesn't say maybe, it doesn't say can be, it says shall be removed from office. Yes. Yeah. There's, not, there's not an option there. So why is he still president? The only thing that I can, I can fathom is the reason why they do not art introduce articles of impeachment against the president is because they're afraid of being called racist and put out. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Oh, right there. The president and the vice president and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment. See, shall be removed from office. And conviction of treason bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. Thank you, sir. It says it right there, black and white, crystal clear. And yet, it's still up for debate that he can still serve as president. Now, it, says, it also says other federal officials. I know a lot of federal officials that should be impeached. You know? So it's not just limited to the president. Like I said, president, vice president, attorney general. We could go on. You know, it says treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. 
high crimes or felonies. You know, uh, the list goes on and on. But what we've come down to is that, oh, well, he's getting away with it. Let's just go ahead and just let him do it for as long as he can. Um, wait until 2016. When I was a delegate to the Republican <laughs> National Convention uh, in 2012, I actually ran into my then congressman, uh, Michael Burgess, and I asked him, I said, if we are not successful at getting Romney elected, will you introduce articles of impeachment against the president? And he said, oh, <laughs> this is what he said, let's wait till November. It's always wait, wait, wait. There, there is no time left. We can't wait till 2016 till this person gets out of office, excuse me, 2017. The time has to be now. So I welcome any questions that you guys have. My cards are over here. I have I my phone number, my email address. Um, I have flyers over here. You can scan the QR code. It'll take you right to my Facebook page. Um, I'm running as an independent, and I think that if we are to be successful um, at going up against the federal tyranny that we see right now, then we all need to, be, need to stand, stand together. What they have done is they have divided us. And mm -hmm. as we all know, a house divided amongst itself cannot stand. Right, yeah. That's what they've done to us. So if we stand united and say, hey, we're together on this, we should, we can be triumphant. So I appreciate you guys' time. Thank you very much. I, I'm burning up, so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Pam, lady okay. first. Just for the record, your site's on Common Core and Gone. Yeah. So my, my question is just for the record, you're, you're with Rebecca here, a strict constitutionalist. Uh, and here, okay. And then my other, my other question was, and I mentioned Justin Dimash's name, uh, rep out of Michigan. Great guy, it seems like. He, he puts why he votes up on every, he's never missed a vote. Right. He describes why he voted and what he voted on every single time. Would you be willing to do something like that? See, yes, I would. Yeah. And that, see, those are things that, that um, adds to account. Right. And, these are the things that make it more acceptable and transparent for other people. Whenever I, if I'm elected, I am not. Ta I'm not taking full pay. I will return. I will take half the pay and return the other half to the treasury. The uh, congressional budget uh, that each each office gets, I will use whatever I need for a minimal staff, and then the rest is going to go back to the treasury to pay down the national debt. Uh, I would like to see any congressperson that's willing to take half pay. You know, the, we're setting, if you set examples, it's easier for the future generations to follow because those set examples are already in place. Like with what, what, what Representative Amash is doing, he's putting every reason why he's there so anybody can come on there uh, and say, you know, he voted for this or didn't vote for this and this is why. <laughs> that's an example that a lot of us should strive for. And that's something that I would like to do as well, you know, like taking half pay to show the, you know, my constituents that it's not about the money. Where it's you, about my people. Where do you stand on term limits? Term limits for congressional representatives, for sure. I, I would, if, if that's the, the first thing that I could uh, do except for or, uh, impeach the president, mm -hmm. uh, my second thing would be to introduce a, an amendment to the Constitution that would allow for <coughs> um, limits to congressional authority. Now, <laughs> there, there's debate on what would be a good limit. I say three terms is, is plenty. Yeah. Um, a lot of people say that's too many. You know, uh, two terms is, is, is enough, you know, for a lot of people. Something done, though. And, uh, you know, three terms, that's, I say that's plenty. Three and four my, terms. My only one thing I would disagree with is returning half the money to the Treasury for them to piss away. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Return you, another you, group. <laughs> you return it to the Treasury and pay down the national debt. That's conservative. <laughs> Go ahead. Pretty sure I probably know the answer to this, but if you were in Congress at the time this came through, would you have taken the congressional out for Obamacare, or would you have entered the exchange? Oh, no. I, I think that is high treason, actually, to apply laws unequally. Because, you know, whenever you, you know, say that I am above you, you know, that's exactly what they're doing. They're saying, I don't have to do this because I'm above you. Yeah. That's wrong. That's not what our, our Congress should be doing. Yeah. They're actually below us. They've actually flipped the switch on, on us, actually, here. It used to be uh, God, the people, government. Now it's the government, people, government.
God. God's, God's last. Yeah. You know, and God's got a problem with that, I can tell you that right now. <laughs> you know, whenever I'm in church, you know, um, and they say, your first fruits go to the, go to your church. The, your very first fruits should go to your church. Well, I don't get a choice of where my first fruits go. They go to the federal government automatically. Right. You know, if, if you want to be honest, I don't think we should have an income tax at all. You know, instead of, you know, an income tax, you know, we replace it with nothing. You know, that would be great, and it would be good for our pocketbooks. A lot of people talk about raising the minimum wage, and the first lesson that you learn in economics 101 is when you raise minimum wage, prices go up. So really, what did you solve? Nothing. You made it worse. So if you want to fix a situation, I'll get you in a second. If you want to fix a situation with, you know, the economy, get more money into people's pockets. Stop robbing them of the fruits of their labor. You know, I would gladly give 15% of my income to my church and know where it's going and see where it's being applied than giving it, giving it to a federal government that is going to use the money to abuse me, going to use it to in ways that I don't think should be used. Um, and, you know, that's where I stand on, you know, uh, the, the 16th Amendment is complete and total repeal of that. Um, 17th Amendment, the same. Um, we need to return the power back to the states. And uh, I'll take another question Just from you. Along the same lines, are you for the fair tax? You know, f fair, you know, that's, that's kind of debatable what you would consider fair. So I, I'm on the fence on that one too, but I was curious. Yeah, it's you know, one. fair to one person might not be fair to another person, you know. And again, that leaves us open to people with the money to say, oh, well, this is fair for me, well, you know. Are you for tax reform? Oh, yes. You know, and the biggest tax reform that we can do is repealing the 16th Amendment and not allowing them to take our money in the first place. Abolish the IRS. Yeah. What about the, uh, what about the uh, lifetime medical and uh, the benefits that the Congress has right and now? Even if you serve one term, you get lifetime benefits. See, I, I don't think what they're doing merits those kind of things. I think, you know, more or less, we have given them the ability you know, uh, the distinct ability to have better health care for themselves um, for doing a job that doesn't require them to put their life on the line. You know, we had the VA brought up. You know, mm -hmm. our Congress people get better treatment and better health care than our veterans. Does that seem right? No. no. You know, no. these people fight and sometimes die for our country, for the Constitution. And yet, our Congress people are getting better health care coverage and, uh, you know, treatment then our veterans, you know, that's just not right. You know, yes, we do have, you know, a, a, a health care system that is, you know, side by side, and it ha we have great examples, but I can tell you right now that our health care, you know, industry, because I, I work in it as a matter of fact, um, it still has problems. Even after Obamacare, health care still has problems, and then those problems are going to persist as long as the industry thinks that they can rake patients over the coals. You know, we have a, you know, a system where I've seen this happen before. Patient will go to the doctor. Doctor says, okay, well, I'm going to get you to go get an x-ray, an MRI, and blood test. And then you go to the hospital for, you know, treatment for what they have found, and they order an x-ray, an MRI, and a blood test. You ask the doctor, you know, can you use what my doctor provided over here? Yeah. You know, yeah. Then, no, I don't want to. See, a lot of that comes in with tort, too. Because the doctor doesn't want to get sued. You know, they want to cover their butt, of course. Yeah. But we don't have this free exchange of information between our doctors, and a lot of that happens to do with, you know, overregulation. And the yeah. idea that we can sit here and allow this system to be uh, perpetrated on us, you know, in our old age, you know, even in, you know, as, we're, as I'm a young person, I can definitely see in the future, this is going to be a problem for me. You know, it's and if we don't fix it, it's going to be a problem for my kids. And I just don't want that. You know, who wants to pass on a system that is, you know, making doctors richer and richer by providing the same services that their grand grandmother and grandfather got? You know, yeah. and and look how um, their health did. You know, we have the this healthcare system that seems to think that the the more we do, um, the better we are. Well, you know, sometimes. It's about the little things that you do. It, it's not about, oh, we need to go in and, you know, do all these tests and all this, all this stuff to find out exactly what's wrong with you. Um, we have basically um, made it into the system where it's a buffet instead of 
out of cards. And that's, that's really what we've come down to is, is that our doctors are able to sit here and you know, order all this stuff. And you can sit here and object to it. You can say, oh, I don't want my blood taken for this mm -hmm. test. And you know, the doctor can sometimes say, well, I'm taking it even if you don't want me to. You know, I'm going to run this test even if you don't want me to. And that's just not right. You know, there are different ways of approaching these things. You know, in dealing with some doctors, and I'll, you know, take another question after this, is that some of them like to play God. And that is, that is true to the, to the T. And some of them think that they're infallible. And as human beings, that's not true. But you have these doctors that are sitting here, you know, making decisions uh, playing games with people's lives, and at the end of the day, they go home, they get in their Mercedes, and, you know, their mind's not really on their patients. They're, you know, about how they're getting paid and all this thing. Um, there is other systems where it's, you know, instead of one doctor, you know, that you have talking about this one patient, it's many doctors in a group. You know, say this, in, in, every chair in here is full with the doctor, I'm a doctor, I stand up and say, okay, I've got a patient that has cancer in the colon, um, you know, and we've tried all these treatments, what do you guys think? Isn't that the group mind, isn't that better than the one single mind coming together? You might even find a better solution that this one doctor didn't think of. You know, that's the system that we should be looking at is to invest in other people's knowledge because why do we send every, every person who wants to be a doctor to school, why don't we just send one, you know? <laughs> See, I mean, it's just, that's the system that we've been fed and we've inherited. And if we don't change it, you know, it's going to pass on. We can change it. It's just the time it takes and the energy it's going to take to change it. That's what a lot of people aren't investing. And we could. So I appreciate you guys. Any other questions? Because okay. um, I've always wondered if how so many bills got passed that weren't constitutional and were a total stab in our back is if they got passed bills that were this thick. Who is going to read through that? That's true, and that's something that is... But do, do the congressmen, do they, do they have the option to say, wait, I'm going to finish reading all of no. this first? No, no. That's nope. got to change. Why, you know, we got, you know, 535 people up there that um, they can pass a bill without a single one of them reading it. And that's, again, that's, that's treason. <laughs> to me, that is treason. You're not um, um, yeah. making laws in order with the Constitution. <laughs> exactly. So we have, we have this idea that we can sit, they can pass these, you know, monstrous bills and not read a single page. Yeah. The Patriot Act, as we know it today, none of them read a single page of that. There's no holds or, like, in the Senate, as a filibuster, there's no holes or anything that can be placed with with the parties there in the, no, the in the house. Have a well, they used to. <laughs> um, so, you know, the leadership down. can't hold up a bill. They can't. But again, if leadership is for a bill that is mm -hmm. so monstrous and everything, it's going to go right through no matter what. It's like you know, Obamacare, or half of the liberals that voted for it. They didn't even yeah. They didn't even oh, They openly so, admit the yeah. They openly so that's so, Yes, this is something that has to change, and I'll tell you how you change it. You take a bill, and you have to cite where it gives you the constitutional authority to do what this bill wants. A lot of our issues would go away almost, you know, I'm not going to say overnight, but it would take some time to say, okay, well, you can't tell me what gives you the power to do what you want to do with this bill, then why should we even vote on it or read it in the first place? You know, yeah. it is humanly impossible to read, you know, a hundred and something thousand pages in four days. And, you know, we've had bills that, you know, maybe not that grand grandiose, but, you know, yeah, um, that's that's something that happens, and that does need to be the stopped. The immigration bill was 847 pages. I happen to have read all but about payments and payments of the immigration bill, but that took me almost a week to read yeah. it. Yeah, there ought to be some kind of limitation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and they say, oh, yeah, well, we're going we're gonna to publish this on the website and allow people to read it. You know, well, even... Normal people can't read that that no. fast. They have to dedicate, a, like you said, a week to reading it. 
And that's reading not the amendments. When you add the amendments the way they word those, you have to literally take the amendment and the bill and... Yeah, and then because you have to take the bill it. and the United States Code and find out what it changes. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, this bill is great, you know, what it says and everything, but to go back and see exactly what it changes, that's that's the, the real meat of the issue. Mm -hmm. You know, the um, like again, with the Patriot Act, um, if you really want to understand the Patriot Act, you have to find out the, the, the Patriot Act as it was passed back in 2003 or whatever it was, and even the most... Thank you, too. And even the most recent amendments and all that stuff that has been added to it. And you have to sit down with the United States Code before 2002 and compare the two and find out exactly what changes. And you will be shocked and horrified. I've done this. It took me a month and a half to do this. I did it with the two common core bills. Yeah, and see, and this is not something that a lot of people are doing right now because they just don't have the time or the want to, or the, you, know, the, you know, the real interest in doing it. But I think we're changing that, you know, to see, to hear people like this, you know, say that, you know, I spent a week reading this bill, that's amazing to me, you know. To have, you know, the, um, the people of this, you know, uh, of this group at least saying, you know, I read, you know, the bill and I read the amendments and all that stuff, that's brilliant. You know, we need more of that. But the problem is that we don't, you know. If we had more of that, we could get it. So I, you know, yeah. <laughs> so I appreciate, you know, is there any other questions? I actually one? think that if uh, anyone was stupid enough to, to really vote in Obamacare, it's like getting a can of vegetables without no one's in it and paying like four times the price of a can of corn kind of what's in it. You know, <laughs> that's that, 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 that that yeah. <laughs> that online. It went, it went viral. People didn't know it was taken with my phone. How much does a, uh, how much did, would your um, spot be in, in Congress as far as your, your salary uh, on an annual basis? $80,000. So you'd, so you'd be down at forty, which is probably like the... In line with us. That's, <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah. See, that's, that's what I make right now. Yeah. So and, why and would I want more than I, you know, I make right now? Would you get for benefits, or would that come out of a check after? You know, again, the whole idea with benefits is that I would, I mean, I would go out and find, you know, something that is good for me. So you'd you have know, in my family. So you wouldn't get automatic free health? No, no because, you know, you know yeah. that's, again... There, uh, there is no reason that Congress people should have better health care than our veterans. It's not the Constitution. Right, exactly. You're willing to lead by example. Exactly. You know, and I think that's what it's going to take. Our current people in power aren't going to lead by example. They're going to lead you the way that they want you to. They want. So, you know, we do have a problem, and to acknowledge the problem, that's half the battle. You know, it, it's like whenever an addict goes to AA, you, they have to admit that they're addicted. Well, we have to get our government to admit that they're a problem. They're not doing that. You know, they're sitting here saying, no, um, this is the problem. They're redirecting their, no, this guy, and, you know, and that, again, that's, you know, part of their irresponsibility. That way they can shirk off, say, well, I didn't pass this bill. I didn't vote for this bill. You know, I didn't vote for the president. You know, our people even have it out here. I drive around in a car that says impeach on the back. You know, how many of, you know, these I get and how many of these I get? Yeah. You know, these make me madder than these sometimes, you know, and I guess that's proportional. But getting the finger whenever I see some, you know, somebody drive by me, it, I, it, it makes me mad. But it doesn't make me mad at the person. It makes me mad that they're ignorant because they don't know what he has done to, for me to put impeach on the back of my car. I'm very passionate about what I believe in, and I think that if more people get fired up and we start spreading the message of, of liberty and a limited government and the restoration of power in the hands of the people, we will be successful. So I, thank you guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's one thing I always see out there is people saying, hey, give, uh, give them no wage and see what they say. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I'll smack that to well, again, okay. again, it's not in the Constitution to give them anything. Um, I'm sorry. Um, before I introduce David, everybody.